Let's take a look at the key steps involved in building a machine learning model. Everything begins with an understanding of the business need. And this is typically driven by the product manager. And the product manager may first start off with a general qualitative statement of what they're trying to achieve. And then further analysis would then result in the definition of a minimum viable product and success and failure criteria so that the entire team knows what success would look like for the project along with failure. And typically in this stage, the product manager should also be able to define what type of problem they're dealing with. Is it a classification problem or clustering or regression? And in the practical portions of the scores, you will have a chance to get hands on and look at how you go about framing the problem by doing things like writing out what it is you want the machine learning model to do and defining your ideal outcome along with your success metrics and determining what you want the output of your machine learning model to look like. And during this phase, another useful exercise to do would also be to consider how you would go about solving the problem if you didn't use machine learning. For example, what heuristics or what other approach would you take? And this then would really challenge you as a product manager to consider whether this problem really needs to be solved using machine learning. And once you've clearly defined your business need, the next step is prototyping. And prototyping can be described as an iterative process that is sort of a feedback loop within the overall flow of machine learning and could be drawn like this. It consists of getting data, and preparing that data, training your models, and then evaluating the models. So let's take a closer look at each step within the prototyping feedback loop. The first step to solving a machine learning problem is accessing data. And typically data scientists will obtain the data for the business problems they are working on by querying the databases where the company stores their data. And this can also include unstructured data sets that do not fit well into a relational database such as logs or raw text or images and videos. And these data sets once identified are heavily processed via ETL pipelines, extract, transform and load pipelines that are written by data engineers and data scientists. And these data sets either reside in a data lake or in a database. And we'll go more in depth into what a data lake is in the data section of this course. So don't worry too much about that now. When data scientists do not have the data they need to solve their problems, they can get the data by scraping the data from websites or purchasing it from data providers or collecting the data from surveys, clickstream data, sensors, cameras, and other sources. And the product manager plays a critical role in determining the data strategy and answering questions like what type of data is needed, how much of the data is needed, and how it can be acquired. And a big part of building a machine learning product is acquiring labeled data, which can be used for training the models. And if high quality data that is relevant to your use case is lacking within the company or in the public domain, product managers then have to consider making a case to the higher management team to acquire data from third parties. And this will require research and making a justification for the investment. And after getting the data, data scientists then prepare the raw data and perform data exploration. And they visualize the data and transform it and possibly repeat the steps until it's ready to use for modeling. And data preparation is all about cleansing and processing raw data before the analysis. And before building any machine learning model, data scientists need to really understand the available data because raw data can be messy and contain duplicates or it could be inaccurate. So data scientists have to explore the data available to them and then cleanse the data by identifying corrupt, inaccurate or incomplete data and replacing or deleting it. And additionally, the data scientists also need to determine if the data has labels or not. For example, if you have a series of images and you want to develop a model that can determine whether there's a car in the image, you need to have a set of images labeled where there is a car in them and most likely need bounding boxes around the cars in the images. And if the images lack labels, then data scientists will have to find a way to label them. And this labeling strategy is something that a product manager would often get involved in, figuring out whether to use an open source tool or look for human labelers who are available for hire who can do the labeling for them. And after the data is cleansed, the data scientists then explore the features in the data set and identify any relationships between the features and make decisions about necessary data transformation. And there are various tools available to do that kind of data exploratory analysis 
using open source libraries and analysis platforms. And it's really important to see what types of features are available in the data set. And remember that features are all the input variables that you would use to try to make a prediction. And so after identifying features and determining what kind of features they are, then data scientists typically obtain a distribution of the values that each of the features has and try to answer questions such as, is the data set skewed towards a range of values or a subset of categories? And what is the minimum, maximum, mean, median, and mode values of the features? And they would look at things like, are there outliers in the database and are they missing values or invalid values? And if so, how many are they? And during the data exploratory step, they also try to understand the relationships between the features. And so they plot the features against each other to identify patterns in the data set. And a part of data exploration is also identifying new features that you can develop that better represent the data set. And this is known as feature engineering. And once the data has been prepared, the next step is model build and training. And this stage consists of choosing the correct machine learning models to solve the problems and deciding what features need to go into the model. And in the first step of model build, data scientists need to decide what might be the appropriate machine learning model to solve the problem. And typically, data scientists will try different models and algorithms and generate multiple model candidates because they may have a hunch, but they wouldn't have a confident understanding of which model would perform best on a data set. So they would experiment with several of them. And during model training, the data scientists might do feature selection, which is the process of selecting only a subset of features as inputs to the machine learning model. And the benefit of reducing the number of input variables is to reduce the computational cost of model training and make the model more generalizable and possibly improve the model's performance. Now, during the model training, the data set is split up into two parts. The first part is training and the second part is for testing. And the training data set is used to train the model and the testing data set is used to see how well the model performs on data that it has not seen. A major task in model training is model hyperparameter tuning. So what is a hyperparameter? Well, models are algorithms and the hyperparameters can be thought of as the knobs that a data scientist can tune to improve the performance of the model. For example, for a decision tree, which we'll cover in a later lesson, a hyperparameter is the depth of the decision tree. So you can choose to have a very deep or a very shallow decision tree, and this will affect the performance of your model. And tuning the hyperparameters of a model can be partially automated, although data scientists are always involved in the process. And while product managers won't be directly involved in the decision, data scientists do have to decide what kind of compute resources they need for training their models. They may be able to prepare and train the model locally on their computer. However, depending on how much data there is, they may need to transition the workload to the cloud where they have access to a broader selection of computing resources, including GPUs. And with some models, they may also have to use specialized hardware and rely on distributed training environments that can speed up the process, especially when the amount of data cannot fit in the memory of the largest machine available. And so data scientists have to consider the training strategy and look at options like splitting and distributing the data across multiple machines, allowing them to simultaneously train multiple model candidates in parallel on separate machines. And the next step in the model prototyping learning loop is model evaluation. And there are many open source tools that help data scientists calculate the metrics for evaluating machine learning models and helping them to visualize the metrics. And if a product manager has done their job, they will have an existing set of success and failure metrics that they can use to evaluate their performance against. And we'll go more in depth into model evaluation and consider approaches like confusion matrix later on. So don't worry too much about it now. However, it is worth noting that the creation of a model that meets your success criteria is an iterative approach. And typically this learning loop will be run through multiple times until a sufficient model has been developed. And once the model evaluation and training processes are complete, the best candidate models are saved. The model, depending on the objectives of the product manager and the team, might be to 
perform a proof of concept or simply perform an experiment or to deploy it to production. And when we say deploy to production, what we mean is that one or more applications will consume the predictions made by the machine learning model in some way. And typically, data scientists will work with machine learning engineers on model deployment. And depending on how you intend to consume the predictions, you can deploy for batch consumption or real-time consumption. For batch consumption, the predictions can be scheduled, say, every hour or every day, and the predictions can be stored in a database and consumed by other applications. And typically, the amount of data you process is larger than for real-time prediction. And a use case for batch consumption might be if you're running an e-commerce site and you want to send out a weekly email to customers about recommended products based on their past purchases, well, this is not a real-time need. And so the machine learning model can be scheduled to run ahead of time and the predictions can be stored and consumed by the application that ultimately will send out the emails. For real-time consumption, however, a trigger would initiate the process of using the persistent model to serve a prediction. For example, if you're deciding whether a transaction is fraudulent or not, when a payment is initiated, this requires real-time predictions. And so you have to consider how quickly you have to serve the predictions. Is it in milliseconds or seconds? And then you have to consider also the volume of demand for the service and the size of the data to run predictions on. And here the product manager, the data scientist, and the machine learning engineer work together to figure out what kind of latency they need to serve the prediction with and look at ways to improve serving latency by doing things like using a smaller model and using accelerators such as GPUs. And once your model is deployed, the next critical step, which is often overlooked by machine learning teams, is model monitoring. And model monitoring is a challenging step that is forgotten by organizations that don't really have mature data science and machine learning teams, but it is critical. And model retraining and redeployment requires time and commitment from team members and compute resources. And ultimately, monitoring the model helps the team decide if and when they need to retrain and redeploy the model. And broadly speaking, monitoring of the model can be broken down into two parts. The first part is drift or statistical monitoring of the performance of the model. And the second is operational monitoring. So let's take a moment to check out both, starting with model performance. After a model is deployed, the metrics by which the model was measured and trained always will tend to go down in production and that is because data is non-stationary in nature and these changes can manifest in different ways. You could have specific features in the production data that are taking values outside of the range of the training data set or you may see a general drift in the distribution of the values across the data set and because of this general tendency of models to degrade over time the quality of the model has to be monitored to decide if it needs to go into retraining. Operational monitoring, however, looks at things like serving latency and memory, CPU usage, throughput, and system reliability. And typically, this will involve close collaboration between the data scientist and the machine learning engineer, and they will review logs and metrics that are set up for tracking and monitoring on an ongoing basis. And it will contain records of events along with the time when they occurred. And these records can be used to investigate specific incidents and figure out the cause of the incident. And tools like Kibana and Prometheus are used for searching, viewing logs, and monitoring these metrics. All right, so that was a look at the steps involved in building a machine learning model. It is important to remember that machine learning is a very iterative process and, and the steps outlined here will be reiterated and improved upon many times. And in this course, you will have practical portions where you will have the opportunity to try out activities in each of these steps to help you get started when you go out into the real world. All right, I will see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.